Tonight, as we continue with this Lenten season's theme of Jesus being our great high priest, we once again turn to the book written to the Hebrews. The, tonight's reading is taken from the 8th chapter as we begin with verse 6. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight as we meditate upon this new covenant that has been established in the blood of your Son and celebrated in this holy meal that he gives to us, we pray tonight for your spirit that we may gain a greater appreciation of what you have done for us and that the evidence of this appreciation might be seen in all, we, in all we do. Let our study tonight bring glory to your name and your name alone as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've had this experience. I'm interested in making a purchase, and so I make the decision to go to Amazon.com. And I do a search for the product that I'm thinking about getting. And I bring up this product. And as I'm reading the description, I notice that a little ways down the page, it lets me know that there is a newer version of this available. And especially if it's technology. And those of you who know me, I kind of like technology, so I can't resist clicking on the newest one. And here's what I find interesting. I'll, and in both cases, I'll take a look at the reviews. And every so often, you will find a product that has, the newer version has overwhelmingly negative reviews. You know, manufacturers seem to promise with new products, you know, this is better, this is the greatest, this is improved, you'll like this better. But as it turns out, it's not so good. And a good number of the people who write reviews on it say they had the old product, they decided to upgrade, and wish they hadn't. That's not the case with the new covenant that God had established, that he promised through the prophet Jeremiah, whose words are in our text for this evening. Jeremiah talked about a new covenant that would take place in the future, a covenant that Jesus speaks of in the words of institution in the Lord's Supper. On this Monday, Thursday evening, we have before us yet another reading from Hebrews that stresses the fact that Jesus is our great high priest. He's a great high priest who has established a new covenant which far, is far greater than the covenant that it replaces. It's an appropriate reading for this evening. Because as we think of those words of institution, we think of what Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, and as Paul wrote, the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus is speaking of a new covenant here, he is clearly indicating that this is replacing that former covenant. Tonight we wish to see more clearly what this new covenant is all about. 
Tonight we wish to gain a greater appreciation of what God is giving us in this new covenant. A new covenant that was established by the shedding of blood, not the blood of animals, but the holy, precious blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that great high priest, who this evening we will see is the mediator of the new covenant. The Jewish people prized that old covenant that God established with them on Mount Sinai. What did they find in that covenant? What did God give to them in that covenant? He gave to them the law. And the reality was, is in that old covenant, every element of their lives was regulated. In that old covenant, we find the moral law, the Ten Commandments, which were for all people of all time. And in those Ten Commandments, what was God doing? He's saying in your life, this is what I want you to do, this is what I don't want you to do. And when it came to worship, there was no freedom. They didn't go to an architect to decide how to build the tabernacle and later on the temple. No, God gave specific instructions to Moses as to how this tabernacle was to be built. Specific dimensions. And when they worshipped, how they worshipped, how the priests were to function in that tabernacle and later on the temple, this was all laid out by God. There was no freedom here. God said, this is what you are to do. The covenant came through Moses. In the book of Exodus, we read, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it to the people and they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. With the blood of a bull, this covenant was established between God and his people. And how did God's people respond? Yes, we like this, we will do this. We are your people. We will do as you say. Did they? Within days, the Israelites proved in a very gross way that they could not keep these commandments. In our text, we're told, but God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. You will recall that while Moses is on the mountain, what happens? The people get impatient. Right? And they go to Aaron and they say, Aaron, we want you to make us a god. We want you to make us an image of a calf, which happened to be one of the gods of the Egyptians. Make it out of gold. So they brought all this gold to Aaron and he melted it down and they made this image of a calf. And there they were, dancing like crazy around it, worshiping it. They were going to keep this covenant? They didn't. So what did God do? How did he respond? Did he wipe them out? He didn't. Instead, what he determined was that he was going to establish a new covenant with them. This covenant would be different. This covenant would be superior to the one that was established there at Sinai. This covenant would be different in several ways. First of all, it was a covenant that was one-sided. In the first covenant, God said, you do this and I will allow you to live in the land of Canaan. I will give you this land and I will bless you there. But this covenant was one-sided. You'll notice that in the words quoted from the prophet Jeremiah, there is only one speaking as this covenant is made. It is the Lord, the one who is the God of grace, the one who keeps his promises. 
Four times in this quotation, we're told, declares the Lord. What does he declare? Things like, I will make, I will put, I will be, and I will forgive. There's nothing about anything for the people to do. He's going to be doing. This is one way. It's a covenant of grace, not like the old one, which was a covenant of works. And it is a covenant of a new quality. It is a covenant that is not conditional like the first one. Now, God had shown mercy to his people in the old, under the circumstances of the old covenant already by taking them out of Egypt. Our text tells us he took, him, took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, right? He's providing for all their needs. Where is he taking them? To the land that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, they sinned. They turned away. And the writer to the Hebrew says, God turned away from them too. By the time that the prophet Jeremiah wrote these words that are quoted here in the letter to the Hebrews, the northern kingdom is gone. Ten, twelve, ten tribes to the north are no more, never will be. During the lifetime of the prophet Jeremiah, the two remaining tribes, which are commonly known as just Judah, they will, go, they will disappear and go into exile. God will allow them to reappear for a short period of time until Christ comes. But after Christ has has established himself and done his work, dies, rises again, and ascends into heaven, shortly after that in 70 AD, Jerusalem is gone. The nation is destroyed. This would now be, the old covenant is now gone. God has established his new covenant, a covenant that was not just for the Jews, but a covenant that was for all people of all nations. And so our text says, but the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises, for if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So the writer to the Hebrew says, this new covenant is obviously better. It has better promises. To go back to the former, as these people were thinking about doing, would be a huge mistake. It doesn't exist. It's gone. It's been destroyed. The writer quotes the prophet Jeremiah using four promises to explain how it's better. The first promise. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. How's the first covenant given? First covenant is given on two tablets of stone, isn't it, at Mount Sinai. This new covenant was going to be written by the Holy Spirit into the hearts and the minds of those who believed in the one who came to establish this covenant. The law would now be a part of them. Paul would write in his second letter to the Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In Christ, we become what? We become new people. What does that mean? We've got new hearts. We've got new minds. God's image is imprinted upon us. We've been set free from the rule of sin in our lives. And what do we seek to do now? We seek to run the path that God puts before us. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, I run the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. This is regeneration. This is crossing over from death to life. This is coming back to life again. We who are spiritually dead when we come into this world. The new covenant produces in us a heart of faith that not only has a knowledge of God's grace, it is empowered by God's grace to walk in his ways. Promise two, I will be their God and they will be my people. How can that be possible? How can the people who cannot keep that first covenant to have sin, how can they possibly be God's people? How can we be God's people? Again, because of grace. We have been doing this throughout the entire Lenten season, and this week we really get concentrated on that focus of walking with Jesus outside of Jerusalem to Calvary. And what do we see there at the cross? Tonight we heard about the Passover lamb of the Old Testament. Well, there is the Passover lamb, and he's the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. There we see on the cross God not sparing his own son, but giving him up for us all. For what purpose? 
as Paul would write, to reconcile us to himself, to pay that ransom price, to set us free from sin, from death, from the power of the devil. He removes our sin. Through faith in his work, what do we have? We've got freedom. We've got security. Paul would write in his letter to the Ephesians, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. You see that the guarantee of our salvation, we are his people, we are secure. Promise three. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. In the Old Testament, God would send those men known as the prophets, right? His, his mouthpieces, his spokesmen. And they came bringing the word of God to God's people. But their word that they brought to the people was not complete. It didn't reveal everything. That revelation became complete when? When the great prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world, bringing to us what? Bringing to us the words of the Heavenly Father, being the representation of the Father. And what has happened with that revelation that he has given to us? It's been recorded for us by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. And it is through those Scriptures that we come to know now the completeness of this revelation of our salvation. So that Paul then could write to the Romans, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God. This is how this salvation is brought to us. As our text says, no matter who we are, no matter what our station is in life, this salvation is ours through Jesus Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. The fourth promise is, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. God's forgiveness is not just winking at our sins, so to speak, looking the other way when we are doing wrong, saying, well, what can you expect? They're sinful human beings. I guess we have to tolerate this. God does not tolerate sin. He does not tolerate sin. He's a holy and he's a just God. And that's what we are reminded of during this Holy Week because justice was carried out. Justice was carried out in his son, who was innocent. He takes our sin, transfers them onto Jesus, and there they're paid for. His suffering is our suffering, isn't it? Think about the confidence that we have. If God simply said, ah, forget about it, and then moved on, he could come back to us someday and say, hey, wait a minute, what about that time when you did such and such, right? Right? Come on, how many times has it happened in life where somebody says they'll forgive you something and then all of a sudden they decide later on, you know what, especially when it comes to money, hey, I want that money, right? God's paid for it. It's been paid for in full. He says things like this to us in the scriptures to emphasize this truth to us. In the Psalms, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. In the book of Micah, we read, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And in his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He never remembers our sins again. What a wonderful blessing. It's a blessing that results from his grace. And so the writer concludes by saying, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. The old covenant was of no use other than it led us to Christ. That covenant disappeared the moment that Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was there no more and there was no more priesthood and there was no more sacrifices being offered. Only one high priest... His office remains forever. And by the way, that's going to be our message for Sunday. That Jesus' office of priesthood is forever, unlike these priests. He is the great high priest, the mediator of this new covenant, a covenant not sealed in the blood of an animal, but sealed in his blood. A covenant of grace, 
that guarantees us salvation. Tonight, as we celebrate this new covenant in the Lord's Supper, as we eat the bread receiving his body and drink the wine receiving his blood, let us do so with joy in our hearts, rejoicing in this covenant that God has established with us through his Son. And may God's forgiveness lead us to a better understanding of our freedom from sin and give to us a renewed sense of real purpose in our life. And what is that purpose? That purpose is to live for him, not under compulsion, not because we have to, but out of love. Out of love, because God, instead of ignoring us and sending us straight to hell as he did with the angels, he provided a way for us in his grace away under this new covenant established in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service tonight continues with the gathering of our thank offering.